Good afternoon all. My name is Tabitha Binding and I work as Head of Education for Timber Development UK. I would like to welcome you this afternoon to our webinar series as on an introduction to engineering with timber. This series aims to add to your engineering education so that as we transition to a bio-based economy, you have the tools and knowledge to include timber within the projects you work on, whether new build or retrofit. Webinar four is an introduction on designing timber connections. And my screen then didn't go on, even though I pressed the right button. Right, come on screen, move. There you go. So Timber Development UK has been formed from the merger of two of the largest and longest established organisations in the supply chain, the Timber Trade Federation and the Timber Research and Development Association that you would have known as TRADA. We are seeking to connect the supply chain to lead best practice and accelerate towards a low carbon future. Our platform is Zoom meetings so that you can communicate with us and your peers. Please post any questions in the chat and we will come to them at the end of Sophie and Andrew's presentations. Please stay muted and you know, be respectful of our speakers. But as I said, please put your questions in the chat and we will come to them at um, between quarter two and 10 to two. So today's webinar will focus on the process of designing timber connections, which some say are the essence of a timber building. building. Our speakers today are Senior Engineer at Structures Workshop, Sophie Fress, and Andrew Livingstone, lecturer at Edinburgh Napier University. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Sophie and Andrew. Thank okay. you, Arthur. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation now? Yes. Great. Uh, let me just try and okay. Perfect. Um, thank you for that introduction. As Tabitha said, uh, my name's Sophie. I work at a company called Structure Workshop. Um, and I thought I would begin with this statement, which Andrew, actually my fellow um, presenter today, uh, showed me, which is by McLean from 1998 that reads, a structure is a constructed assembly of joints separated by members. And I figured it was appropriate at this stage in the webinar series to shift the focus from the design of members themselves to the ways in which we connect them. So in webinars two and three, we've learned how to design a timber beam and a timber column. And although these are fundamentals, which of course any timber designer must know, connections, as Tabitha alluded to, is they were often overlooked despite potentially being the most critical factor. And this is not only true for timber design, of course, if you're designing concrete, you may find that geometrical constraints influence size of members, whether it be due to bending radiuses or spacing requirements or lap lengths in reinforcement. And designers will be aware that how they detail the reinforcement between members will impact the stiffness of that connection, which will in turn influence the overall behavior of the structure. Similarly with steel, designers must think about the spacing and arrangement of bolts. You may need to increase beam sizes to accommodate the number of bolts you require, for instance. And the same applies for timber, but even more exaggerated because the required spacing and edge distances for fasteners in timber, in timber is much larger than it is for steel. So without further ado, what are the options for connecting timber together? They can be loosely grouped into the following categories all timber, also known as carpentry joints, connections involving metal fasteners and connectors, and glued connections. And they can also be a mix of two or even all three of these. We won't unfortunately have time to touch on glued connections in today's webinar, um, because there's so much to say on the first two, and really we'll only be scratching surface. <laughs> Um, but I'd like to start by talking about carpentry joints. And I wanted to start here because they're usually left until the end in all of the timber design manuals and guides. And I suppose this is because in modern construction, they are being used less and less. Um, because the use of dial type fasteners like bolts and screws, which we'll talk, talk about later, has made jointing timber so easy, quick, cheap, and it gives you a lot of freedom with geometry. But that doesn't mean to say that carpentry joints don't have a place in timber structures today. The project on the screen is Homerton College Dining Hall, which I've talked more about in another TD UK talk if you're interested. Um, but this was completed just a couple of years ago and all the joints that you see on the screen are free from metal fixings and are connected using basic, basic carpentry joints. 
before we worked on this project, when I thought of carpentry joints, I thought about, you know, green oak frames that you see in pubs or just really nice fancy furniture. And I'd never designed carpentry joints in any projects beforehand. And I couldn't even find really any modern precedents that used carpentry alongside um, like engineered products. Um, so on this job, I was really lucky to work with a passionate architect and timber fab fabricator that saw the benefit in jointing the timber in this way without metal. And I think this project really demonstrates that the old methods of jointing timber can go hand in hand with modern structures and engineered products. So although there are a lot of forms of carpentry joints, it is possible to reduce the multitude of joints down to some basic types. Four of the most common types are shown here. So on the left, you can see a couple of tenon joints. On the top right, there's a half lap connection. And on the bottom right, this A1 uh, shows a dovetail and B shows a cogging joint. So the plethora of carpentry joints are really just variations and elaborations on these simple types. And the joints have been developed, honed and improved over time. And that's one of the great things about, about carpentry connections is they've been tried and tested and improved over time. So you know your joint's going to perform well. Take uh, the mortise and tenon joints here, for example. The bottom is just a slight variation on the top, but is much better in carrying load. So by simply notching the column further to house the beam's full cross section, I'll just try and zoom in here. Um, the, yeah, so you can see the column is notched further to house this whole cross section, which increases its capacity. So without the housing, the tenon is required to take the full shear force and compression perpendicular to the grain. Um, the tenon, for those who don't uh, know, is, is the bit that juts out, and then this hole would be the mortise. You can see in this connection as well, there's holes for timber pegs, which can be introduced to either just ensure a good fit of the joint or to also provide resistance if, say, this beam has tension forces in it. So yeah, as I said, carpentry joints are, are just really elaborations on the basic types shown previously. This example shows how multiple members can be connected together using a mix of different types of uh, tenons, cogging joints, dovetails. This picture was taken from Green Oak in Construction, a publication from Trado, which I highly recommend if, you, um, yeah, if you're new to this sort of timber engineering and you're working with green timbers or carpentry joints. So... This, these photos show one of the joints in the Homerton College Truss, uh, where the bottom strut meets the column. And this is a classic example of a framed joint used to transmit compression forces from one member to another at an angle. So the compression in the inclined member is transferred to the column purely by contact of the frontal area of the joint, so where your, my cursor is now. Um, that small notch was all that was required to transmit the force because the compressive strength of this timber was so good. And by capitalizing on that compressive strength, we ended up with a really attractive joint that was free from any bolts, screws, steel plates. And the tenon here was solely to keep the joint in the right position. So it wasn't actually um, providing any, any mating surface or anything like that. This was another photo taken from Constructional Timbers Workshop up in Barnsley during the fabrication of the trusses. And as you can see from this picture, much of the fabrication had to be done by hand. This did mean that the fabrication of the trusses was quite slow and, as you can imagine, not very cheap uh, because it's very specialist. Um, this was a really unique project and we had the luxury of jointing the timber in this way, but that is not often the case, which is why one of the reasons dial type fasteners like bolts and screws are so useful in construction today. So the last two slides showed photos from uh, my project Homerton College, Cambridge, and although I designed them, I definitely did not invent them. Uh, not taking any credit for that. They were lifted from this book. And if you're interested in different types of joint, this is a great book for the bookshelf. It's just a picture book, but great for inspiration. So if you're working on a project where you want to know more about joints, get some inspiration, um, definitely try and find this one. So I mentioned before about the compressive strength of timber being so important. So I thought I'd just hone in on that briefly. This is a check that you'll most likely need to perform when designing carpentry joints, and that's the compression perpendicular to the grain. This check is often forgotten about, but is critical when you're designing members to transfer forces through mating faces. 
So this expression here is taken from the Eurocode and states that the compressive stress perpendicular to the grain should be less than or equal to a factor Kc90 multiplied by the design compressive strength of the timber. The compressive stress is calculated by dividing the force by the effective area. So instinctively, you might think that the effective area was just the contact area, but it can actually be greater than this. This is because when you stress timber perpendicular to the longitudinally oriented fibers, the fibers compress, which can lead to large deformations. But the material around the loaded area will help to minimize the deformation under the load, as you can see from these um, diagrams at the bottom right. The areas around the mating surface actually contribute and, and stop the deformation. Um, so the Eurocode allows you to increase your bearing length by the lesser of 30 millimeters L, which is the actual contact length, and L1 over 2. So the Eurocode define L1 it, by through the use of these two diagrams. So the diagram on the left shows a timber with a continuous support. So this could be, for instance, a timber sole plate bearing continuously onto a concrete slab. And the arrows there could represent timber studs coming down. So L1 there would be the clear distance between your studs. And then the other um, situation that the Eurico describes is where you, you have a timber member on a discrete support. So this could be a timber beam bearing onto a column. So these arrows here represent a column. And then the loading arrows here could represent a secondary beam or a joist. So L1 in this situation would be from the face of the column to the face of your applied lo uh, beam loading your beam. So take King, uh, this simple example where we have secondary beams bearing on top of a primary beam, which in turn bears onto columns. The effective bearing length of the primary beam at the column location, so here, is calculated as 230 millimeters up from 200, which is the width of the column. And uh, the effective bearing length on the primary beam at the beam to beam location here is calculated as 160 up from 100. So you're getting a real benefit. Um, from those values, you can easily calculate compressive stress perpendicular to the grain in the primary beam. I won't go through this line by line, but this um, webinar will be available on YouTube after if you want to have a look at this in more detail. The design compressive strength, FCD90, uh, is calculated by taking the characteristic strength and multiplying this by K mod and dividing it by the material safety factor. If these factors are new to you and don't ring any bells, I implore you to have a look at the first two webinars to familiarize yourself with these. The characteristic strength um, FC90K can just be found in BSEN338 for normal timbers, but for different engineered products, you might have to find technical data sheets online. So KC90, this factor here, a bit of a weird one, but takes into account the load configuration, the possibility of splitting, and the degree of compressive deformation. It should never be taken greater than 1.75 as per Eurocode and should by default be taken as one. The Eurocode provides values for KC90 for softwood timber and softwood glue lamb for a couple of loading conditions, and they're written here, and they vary from 1.25 to 1.75. I won't read these out, but um, yeah, I, it took me a while to get my head around them. But in this example, assuming the timber is softwood, KC90 would equal 1.5 since the beam is supported on a discrete support and the application of load is more than double the height of the beam away from the support. Bit of a mouthful. But that's not always the case. And if you're ever in doubt, you should set KC90 to 1. So... Your members may not always be perpendicular and you may need to check your compressive stresses at an angle to the grain. This check is very easily performed to the Eurocode using the expression shown on this slide. And so once you know how to check for compression at an angle, you can pretty much design any joint you want within reason. So this was the central joint at Homerton and my design checks was pretty much just checking compressive stresses at an angle to the grain. 
So despite my enthusiasm for carpentry joints, they do have their limitations. They aren't really suitable to resist large moments, for instance, nor are they that practical when you have many members meeting at a node like you do here. So this artwork consists of thin Canadian Douglas fir members connected into regular tetrahedrons, which are then positioned against one another to create a stack of tetrahedra. Uh, the members are bolted together by a steel plate that are CNC cut and positioned in each vertex. This picture shows just four tetrahedrons connected together, but there's a stack of, I think, 13 in the Ministry of Justice. Uh, it's a really interesting project if you want to read more about it on our website. But yeah, here it uses just standard bolts. And this is another example of how you can connect timber together with bolts. So this, unlike the previous artwork, the budget on the project was very tight, and so an economical fixing method was required. The elements in these trusses are simply arranged side by side and bolted through. You can also see that the bottom cord has been lengthened by simply bolting on timber sandwich plates. Try and zoom, zoom in here. So you can see these timber sandwich plates were used to lengthen the bottom cord here in a really, really simple and economical joint. Um, and so despite this being quite raw and agricultural and an economical solution, the outcome is actually surprisingly beautiful. So bolts are generally made in mild steel. You generally specify 4.6 up to 8.8. .8. You're not really going to get a benefit any stronger than an 8.8 .8 bolt when jointing timber. And they usually have hexagonal heads or square heads and nuts. Here you can see hopefully um, some large square washers. And if you design in steel, you might think oh, they're pretty large. And that's because when you're putting washers against timber, you do want them to have a side length if they're square or a diameter if they're circular of at least three times the diameter of the bolt itself. And bolts uh, in timber, you're generally looking at M8 to M30s. I've never specified anything over an M24 personally. Um, so, yeah. And... The Eurocode also states that bolt holes in timber should have a diameter not more than one millimeter larger than the bolt. So, so the larger the hole, the more tolerance you get during construction. However, the lower the shear capacity of the fastener and the greater slip the connection may experience. And I highlight this because it's important sometimes put, to put that in this in your specifications because it's not uncommon for holes to be made larger for buildability. If you're used to steel, for instance, an M10 bolt, it wouldn't be unusual for your hole in your steel plate to be two, two millimeters bigger. So there's just something to be aware of. So another type of Fastener similar to bolts is a smooth steel dowel, um, but it's just without the head and the nut. And this offers an attractive alternative with a slightly reduced capacity. The reduction in capacity is due to the absence of the sort of clamping that you get when you tighten a nut on a bolt, which Andrew will probably touch on a, a little bit more when he talks about the more technical side of um, dowel type fasteners. Um, what's nice about dowels is that you can you can size them so they're slightly less wide than your timber assembly, and then you can plug them so you can create an invisible connection if that's what you want. And also this plugged type joint is good if you have an exposed connection that needs to be designed for fire because your plug can, your, can protect your dowel. Um, and like with bolts, uh, you typically see dowels with diameters ranging from eight millimeters to 30 millimeters, but with dowels, your hole cannot be larger than the dowel itself because it needs to have a tight fit. So this puts more onus on workmanship, which could result in increased costs. But if you don't like the appearance of bolt heads and nuts, then they can be a really good choice. Um, in this example here, dowels are used to connect the rafters to the columns, and they're so discreet, you can't even really see them. Uh, you can see the four tiny dowels positioned in the corner there. Another fastener you can use to connect in is the coach screw, which is sometimes referred to as a lag screw. These are large screws, generally varying from six millimeters in diameter up to 20. They're similar to a bolt in that they have a hex hexagonal or square head and should be installed with those oversized washers I talked about previously. They need to be installed into pre-drilled holes because they're so large, as I said, over six millimeters in diameter. Uh, this does add time to installation, which may make them less favorable than smaller wood screws, but their load carrying capacity is very good. 
coach screws are really good at attaching steel plates to timber and in say a single shear connection they're pretty much as good as bolts in this project here at Brockwell Park in London, the rafters and the columns were built up from two members of the same size, side by side, and we used coach screws to fix them together and counterboard the, the heads into the timber to, so they finished flush with the timber, which looked really neat in, in the end product. So working our way down in size, the next fastener I'll just touch on quickly is the wood screw. These are typically six millimeters in diameter or less, and they come in a variety of different shapes, but typically have a countersunk head and a shank that is threaded for about 60% of its length, but they can be fully threaded. Uh, there's lots of different alternatives out there. Uh, in softwoods, wood screws with a diameter of six millimeters or less don't need to be pre-drilled, although doing so does increase its capacity. It also allows screws to be spaced closer together, which can be beneficial if you're struggling to fit in the number of screws you need. For this job on the screen, a job that we did with Field and Files Architects, we use wood screws to connect the truss elements together with plywood gussets. The gussets were installed on both sides and the wood screws terminated within the softwood. Um, so in here so they were just acting in single shear and you can see hopefully from this picture that the spacing of the screws is larger parallel to the grain than it is perpendicular to the grain this the required spacing is provided in the Eurocode for all the different types of fasteners and it varies between nails and small screws and large screws you can also see from this picture that the distance between the end of the member here and the first line of screws is quite large. And that distance is really important to avoid things like split prop propagation coming from the ends of the member. So the final fastener I'll mention uh, is the humble nail. So the nails are probably the most commonly used fastener in timber construction and like wood screws are available in a variety of types, lengths, cross-sectional areas. The most common type might be the smooth steel wire nail, which has a circular cross-section and is cut from wire coil. Again, available in a standard range of diameters, even up to a maximum of eight millimeters and can be plain or treated against corrosion, for example, by galvanizing. They can be driven by hand or machine driven. You'd probably specify machine driving if uh, for things like uh, plywood sheathing or OSB sheathing to softwood framing. Pre-drilling is not normally carried out on softwood timber, but it can be done and does have benefits like it does for screws. So not only is the load carrying capacity of the nail increased by pre-drilling, but the spacing between the nails can be reduced, enabling those more compact joints. Pre-drilling should be performed when working with very dense timbers to avoid excessive splitting. This picture was taken from one of our projects down in Devon, where we're turning a dilapidated farm building into apartments. And this connection is similar to the one on the previous slide, where a plywood gusset is being used to connect the timber members together. But due to the size of the plywood gusset and the number of nails, this connection is an example of a rigid joint providing good moment capacity to this portal frame. I thought I'd uh, quickly share this photo just because it's a good example of how different connection methods can be used harmoniously together within one project. So the main scissor trusses here are built up from members positioned side by side and through bolted with just M12 bolts with circular washers. They're counterboarded to the timber to make it look discreet, just like the coach screw photo I showed previously. The plan bracing simply comes into the side of the rafters and is fastened with wood screws. The timber boards on top are half lapped side by side and nailed to the timber members. So there's a bit of everything. The balustrade itself also has concealed steel plates inside it and used with wood screws to create a nice clean finish. And this is just another example where we've got a beam to column connection with a hidden steel flitch plate. We've got smooth steel dowels that are plugged with a timber, with a dissimilar timber. So you still get a nod to the joint, but you don't see any metal. The purlins are half notched onto the beam. Again, wood screwed from above, so you don't see any fasteners and it's just a really clean, um, yeah. 
Uh, and just before I hand over to Andrew, I just thought I'd finish um, touching on some proprietary products available on the market that are frequently used in timber construction. So here are just a variety of different nailing plates, nailing plates being light gauge, mild steel with pre-punched holes for nails or screws. The most familiar type of nailing plate you'll see here, probably the joist hangers. So you know these two types of, of, of nailing plates um, that are used to, as the name suggests, hang joists. Very economical connections, lots of different suppliers, and you can generally find performance data online. Again, Andrew could probably give a presentation on just these alone, but <laughs> just move swiftly on. <laughs> Uh, another great source of information you can find online is screw capacities. This is just an extract from uh, Rother Blath's catalogue. They have an extensive range of screws and their technical data is really well presented and openly available. So they're a very good resource. There are also lots of proprietary options for connecting timber to other materials. This is a classic example of a column based connection. Columns you typically want to raise up from your structural slab for durability reasons. And so there's lots of different pedestals on the market offering lots of different load carrying capacities, uh, ones that can provide adjustability. So, yeah, a Google search is really your friend when it comes to proprietary timber fixings. And uh, I would just, my final slide, I'm just calling out some of my favorite suppliers here. Simpson Strong Tie, I don't think I've ever done a project where I've not specified one of their products. Sherpa, they're very good for concealed connections. Rotherblast, as I mentioned, extensive catalog of screws. And Eurotech, which is, um, yeah, sort of a competitor to Rotherblast. So I will pass over to Andrew now to get more into the fun calculations of dial type fasteners. I, I think everyone can see my screen. Any thumbs up? Perfect. So I'm Andrew Livingston and so thank Hang you. Hang on, Andrew. Hang on. You're sharing now sharing the wrong screen. It's coming oh, up as a Zoom screen. Perfect. I think we have the right screen. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I'm Andrew. I'm working at Neurocode Design for Dell type fasteners. Dell type fasteners can be nails, screws, bolts. As Sophie was saying, or even these big lag screws that Sophie was referring to. Now, let's go back a little step here. Johansson, back in 1942, first um, published this work. Um, it wasn't until 1949 that he published it again, but in English this time. But for simplicity just now, we'll look at the assumptions that he put forward, the connections follow a, a rigid plastic behaviour for the dowel rotation and for the embedment of the timber. Embedment of the timber is essentially the crushing of the timber when a dowel fastener is put through it. So there, there's three main parameters that have influence over the connections. That is the bending capacity of the dowel or the yield moment, the embedment strength of the timber, that's the crushing strength of the timber, and then the withdrawal strength of the dills, that's pulling pulling out our head side pull through. So before we go any further, let's talk about notation. Um, this is for a single shear connection. So T1 is the head side member, and T2 would be the point side member, minus the actual point length itself. We're not going to touch on too much in double shear today, but this is an example of a double shear notation. So going back to single shear, um, Sophie had a lovely example where it's very similar to this using screws. There'll be an overlap within the middle member. As long as it follows this criteria here, which is essentially limiting how far that point can get to the edge of the middle member. But the embedment strength, um, this is again looking at the crushing effect in the timber. timber. The embedment strength test comes from BSEN383, which is simplified down to this equation here. However, 
Hans Blass uh, put it quite simply when he wrote this. Um, the density, which is the only mechanical property of the timber used, has an influence on the connection. The faster diameter, that could be the smooth shank or the outer thread of a screw, for example. The angle between the load and the grain direction. The friction, we'll talk about friction in a minute or two. And then, of course, the moisture content. For the embedment strength of dowel type fasteners, this is one example of one of the tables from Unicode 5. We'll just simplify that just now. And we'll look at just timber to timber connections with the dowel type fasteners up to eight millimeters. We've got the characteristic embedment strength for uh, dowels with, without pre-drilled holes and with pre-drilled holes. Again, we've got rho K, the characteristic density for the material is the only mechanical property used of the, of the timber. Now, when we connect timber to timber or timber product to timber product, um, if we have different um, densities in the timber or if we have different uh, members that are pre-drilled and non-pre-drilled, then we're likely to have different characteristic embedment strengths of the members. And this is just a ratio to make it to simplify the equation for both members. However, if you have both members pre-drilled or non-pre-drilled, and you have the densities, the characteristic densities the same, you can simplify beta down to one. Now, the characteristic withdrawal capacity of the dowels um, is essentially the axle withdrawal of, of a fastener or the head side pull through of a fastener. We've got two examples here for nails or belt type fasteners other than smooth nails or for smooth nails here. We still have, however, to get the characteristic point side withdrawal strength and the characteristic head side pull through strength. These are should be determined by test. However, we can calculate it as long as these following criteria are met or uh, not calculate today. The following criteria are the point in penetration should be at least 12 times D to calculate using axle withdrawal head side pull through. However, reduction factors may come into play. For smooth nail, the point in penetration uh, it should be at least eight times the outside diameter. However, when the point side penetration is smaller than 12 times the outside diameter, the withdrawal capacity should be uh, multiplied by this reduction factor here. And for threaded nails, that could be helicoidal or screws, uh, so forth. Again, the point side should be at least minimum six times the diameter. But when it is less than eight times the diameter, we multiply it by this reduction factor here. So we move on to the friction effect. Pardon me. So there are two types of friction effects we'll look at. So the first one we'll totally ignore, which is essentially when you do the connection, the members may physically touch. And there will be um, an effect of friction in real life. However, throughout the service serviceability of the building or the structure, the timbers may shrink and no longer uh, connect. So therefore, we'll, we'll ignore that in our calculation. However, the second form of friction we want, when a dowel uh, yields either once or twice, that's pulling the head side member towards the point side member. This is causing a friction effect between those two members here. So we will be looking at that. So this is a, a simplified version of the Johansson's equations. It takes form of three parts. The friction factor, um, which is the multiplication of the middle part of the Johansson's load. 
and the rope effect we'll come to in a minute. If the fastener only yields once, or partially yielded, then we have a 5% uplift on the Johansson part. If the fastener yields twice, or is fully yielded, then we'll have a 15% uplift on the Johansson part. Again, we'll come to that in a minute. And now we're going to look at the, the rope effect. The rope effect is essentially the addition of the axle withdrawal of the, the fastener in a shear load scenario. What we'll find is the, the equation should be this, which is the minimum of these two equations here, which is essentially the axle withdrawal characteristic divided by four, or this limiting percentage. What we find Probably in all of the images that Sophie shared before, I would imagine this would never be the limiting factor. We only tend to find this becoming the limiting factor in very limited situations, usually in, or not usually, sometimes within mass timber uh, designs using fully threaded screws. We may find this becoming a limiting factor, but very seldom have I ever seen that. So it's going to be most of the time that will be the limiting factor. So let's have a look at Johansson's equations themselves. We have six failure modes. Now again, this is back from 19, 1942 or 1949. He identified six different failure modes. The first two failure modes, A and B, are essentially the embedment of either the head side or the point side member, that's the crushing of those members, or failure mode C, where we've got the embedment of both head and point side member, uh, where the dowel is still stiff and rigid and not yielding. Failure mode C, sorry, failure mode C is where we have the yielding of the dowel in the point side member, or failure mode E. Uh, the, the double yielding in the head side member. Failure mode F, this is where the 15% uplift comes from, is where we've got yielding in both both members. Those equations actually look something like this. Actually, fairly straightforward, even though it looks a bit scary at first. However, what you would do is you would calculate each of these in turn, and from that, the minimum identifies the predicted failure mode of that connection in an ultimate limit state. Um, and that would give you the characteristic resistance and shear for, for that connection. So I'm going to round up here. So, so far, we have got the characteristic withdrawal capacity, the characteristic lateral nail shear resistance. We've also identified the failure mode of the connection. However, what we don't have time to show you today, but rather easy to move forward with, is we've got the design resistance perfecting, which is fairly straightforward. But then we have to calculate the effective number of fixings for the whole connection. And then after that, we've got the splitting capacity. Sophie talked about this before, of the members. And that is to do with the edge and end distances and the spacing between the fasteners. So on that note, I would like to thank you very much. And Sophie, if you... Yeah, if you have any questions, please, please feel free. Sophie? Um, yeah, I don't really have, have much else to say. I think I've... Uh, I know that was we were probably less time than we thought we were going to be. So we've got a decent amount of time for questions. If uh, yeah, if you want to write them in the chat, Tabitha, I don't know how you want to. If it's OK with you, I will go from the top down and we'll work our way through. Um, so first of all, really hot off, off as soon as you started. So we had Louise um, asking about the complementary joint. Can you yeah, take the... I think I answered that by just the if on the next few slides uh, I touched on I touched on uh, yeah compressive strength 
at an angle to the grain. So again, this uh, just refers to the Eurocode. It's a simple check. Yeah, brilliant. Fantastic on that. Um, then we have Luca with multiple parts of the question um, saying how excellent the talk was. And I must yeah, utterly agree on that. Um, right, part one. If one follows the EC5 rules, could they claim that the connections designs are ductile? He apologizes you for putting that on the spot. I'm going to apologize for putting Andrew on the spot with that question. <laughs> Um, no, are you, um, sorry, sorry, microphone on, yes, it is on. Are you, no, no. What you have is you have um, embedment or yielding and a shear load capacity. When it comes to axle withdrawal, yeah, it's not a ductile connection at all. I can't yeah. think of anything that would be ductile. Would, it, would a, a flitch point be ductile? Even that wouldn't be ductile. The answer is no. Thanks, Andrew. And then with just a final part, screws and CS heads. Would you specify chamfered holes in the plates to prevent failure just under the head? If I were using a countersunk head screw with the head slide on the plate, I would I would chamfer the hole, well, personally, just for aesthetic reasons. <laughs> There's probably a structural benefit as well. Um, but yeah, that's often you wouldn't want to use a countersunk head with a steel plate because that's extra prep. So you, you move, yeah, you'd choose something like a domed head or something on your wood screw instead. Thanks for that, Sophie. And then we have John um, asking in terms of exposed connections, including exposed plywood gussets, about fire engineering and stipulating, you know, fire protection. Um, so on none of the ones I've designed have we had to protect them from fire because they've just been for roofs so it was deemed that they didn't need to have a uh, fire resistance period if they do need to be uh, resistant to fire a plywood e external gusset plate might be pretty difficult to justify in fire <laughs> haven't done one myself um because yeah designing that to char it might, it will probably fail in a 30 minute fire. <laughs> However, you do have beautiful connection types that you can use, either proprietary from Ruffle Blast or other people that are designed so that it's totally hidden. But then you've got, there's, there are people doing that type of connection that can help in fire. However, sometimes it's better to have no metal visible at all and have that fully hidden from the back side. So CLT to CLT connections, you want to make sure all of that's out of the way. Because if you've got a dowel that's visible and it starts charring, it starts charring down the length of the dowel as well. So we'll have to be really careful in a one hour, a one hour fire scenario or, or greater. Exposed bolts in a connection is literally the worst case in a fire situation. Dowels, <laughs> exposed dowel ends, they're better than bolts, but as Andrew says, you still don't want to see any metal. Brilliant, thanks both. Mm -hmm. um, Sam, as a, do you recommend any timber connection design software? Um, presuming that all timber connections or carpentry are calculated by hand on a case-by-case -case basis? Okay, I'll answer that. Um, but I'm a little bit biased, first of all. I wrote one of them. Uh, but my our colleague Kirsty also wrote another one. Is that my pronouncing his name correctly? Oh, Katie. Oh, Kirsty. He also wrote another one as well. However, both he and I have agreed that what we do is we just calculate the axle withdrawal and the shear of one faster. And then after that, we do everything else by hand. That's literally what we do, and we're the people that wrote two of the bigger connection software packages, mainly because every connection I tend to do doesn't fall in line with the software that I wrote. So our software that I wrote anyway tries to be tries to be too too standard and try to do things. In reality, my connections are not standard. Mine's are unusual every time. So I just calculate one one faster and I multiply it by the effective number, that's what I do. Thanks, Andrew. 
Um, Jasmine, um, how is additional deflection due to slippage considered in deflection of timber trusses? <laughs> I've, I've never taken it into consideration in any of my designs, but that might be because I've never designed a truss long enough for it to be significant. Yeah, I have. Um, a 30 meter clear span Belfast truss. Um, yeah, you do have to take that into account because when you start talking about lengths of that size, you've got, um, but I, I think from memory, I could be wrong here, but a connection slip by say you know, just one mil perhaps has a massive, a massive effect over deflection downwards. And the equation to work that out is quite something as well. Um, so you do have to take that into effect. And one design, was a, it was actually a box truss we had. It was a 12 meter box truss. Um, box truss, is that the right name? Box beam, box beam. Mm -hmm. uh, plywood yeah. either side, two, bo two members top and bottom. Um, we had to put a 40 millimeter canter, um, 40 millimeter, say it for me. Um, Camber. I've forgotten the word. Camber. Camber, thank you. We put a pink camber into it um just to try and just to minimize that risk but you do have to you do have to think about the connection slippage i have a tutorial question i give out to my fifth year students for it, it revolves all around that i'm afraid <laughs> so you, you'd like to share it with your audience or uh, if you'd like to try that you know just uh, ping andrew a message for uh, and you know uh, work out the exercise um from erasmus can coach screws be used instead of bolts for flitch plates? And would you? I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. I think the I the I and Trada guide they give specific they they give a limited amount of um, different. They give tabulated uh, capacities for different types of connection setups. And I don't believe coach screws are ever used in a double shear connection, which might be why this question is being asked. And Andrew, I don't know why that's not possible. Yeah. I, I'm not a fan of lag screws. Um, lag screws have a, a tensile yield strength of about 400, where your mechanical, like your rocko blast or your heco screws, I've got like a 1000 in comparison. So you can put these smaller, fat, put more of these smaller fasteners in and get a stronger connection than using lag screws. However, I understand though that lag screws can give a, a better looking connection perhaps rather than having a peppered, uh, pepper dotted connection. Um, yeah. I'm not a fan of them personally, because I used to use them a lot in my previous job, and I've seen a, I've seen a couple of them fail in real life. The heads, yeah. the heads just shoot off. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and Helen's asking, is there some specific guidance on when you need to consider a connection as fixed based on the number of screws and its config configurations as opposed to pinned? So I know that there's there's standard guidance for steel on this with the spacing of your steel bolts to make sure it's not too big because then it won't be classified as pinned anymore. There's a certain level of fixity. I don't know if anything similar exists with timber. Yeah, yeah there's a piece of software by a gentleman called oh, uh, Paniotis Pacalatis who wrote... Um, connection software called Rope Effect, actually, I think it was called. And it was looking at that very thing. It was looking at the, the rotational stiffness of a connection. And that, again, Sophie hit the nail on the head. Now, I'll have a, a rotational stiffness, and you'd work out what its stiffness would be. So to say that it's ever fully fixed will be difficult, but it's essentially working on the sheer strength of one dowel if it's a circular pattern that you've got, it's just the lever arm to that. It's a fairly straightforward calculation. Um, and some of your examples would exhibit uh, a stiffness, rotational stiffness in your photos, Sophie. 
Yeah. It's the same problem that you have with steel and concrete design, that your idealized behavior, uh, you know, often is a pin joint, but in reinforced concrete, you're never, you're unlikely to produce a perfect pin, just like in steel, when you introduce, you know, two bolts, it's suddenly not a perfect pin. Um, and if you're working on a complex structure, often you need to take the stiffness of that joint into consideration in, say, a global FE model. The kind of size of the structures that uh, I design at Structure Workshop never really warrant that kind of um, level of detail. But I'm sure there's people out there that uh, yeah, have to consider these things all the time. Thank you. And Gonzalo? How would you reinforce a carpentry joint with full thread screws? How do you calculate the stiffness and the strengths if you do use them? Yeah, so fully threaded screws can be really good for things like half notch connections. If you're notching the ends of the beams to say, um, bear it onto another member, you can use fully threaded screws insert from above to kind of clamp the timber together to stop it from getting a, a split, propag propagating again from the end. I know Rotherblast, I think, have a calculation, some calculation software to calculate this, the additional stiffness. I'm not sure what that calculation is based on, though. I think Rotherblast is not They definitely do have that software. So does. Um... Heco as well. Heco have a similar software online. And yeah, that's good. It works. Thank you. And Louise is uh, another question on fire. If you consider hidden steel connections for fire, do you have to take into account the charring rate of the timber? Example, if the steel would become exposed due to the timber, you know, charring. You absolutely do take into account the effect of charring. And with Steel connections, it's even more complicated because, as Andrew was saying before, the steel heats up. And so if you've got a flitch plate, it's not just you're not thinking about the timber charring one dimensionally like you would if you're just looking at, say, a beam charring from both sides. You've also got to think about the effects that it's doing to the timber deeper within the member. So it's really difficult and there's not really any design guidance for uh, checking exposed steel connections in timber i think because it's just there's so many uncertainties and they're maybe not tested so as andrew said there's a lot of products out there that are for this um situation exactly they're concealed uh they maybe even have fire stops around them and yeah generally you want to be avoiding avoiding steel exposed in a fire situation and I believe those proprietary connections that take fire into consideration give you a minimum size of your connecting members for a fire period. So it makes sure that there's still insulative timber around your metal and metal parts. Thanks for that, Sophie. And thanks to Helen for um, finding out the word that Andrew was lost, the pre -camber. So she popped it in the chat. Um, one for you, Andrew, you mentioned a chap's name called Paniotis. So there's just, uh, would you possibly pop, pop it in the chat so that everybody can see and then, you know, carry on and uh, search for the name. I have to try and find the spelling for it. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I realised, Tabitha, that I forgot to mention mm. in my part was just about moisture. And Andrew did touch on it. And again, just hogging back onto why carpentry is so good. Sometimes we want to... Um, yeah, we'll be, have to design in green timber or timber with a high moisture content. And say if you want to use a flitch plate in conjunction with that, you've got to think about how that moisture content in the timber is going to change from the time of installation to the in service over its lifetime. Because what you have, if you put a steel plate with steel bolts next to timber and then the timber wants to shrink, it will shrink away and go to the bolts and may cause splits or shakes in, in your timber member. So that is, is really important. And so often in, in uh, green timber, bearing connections are preferred. If you can just bear your beam onto a bearing plate, it will be able to shrink 
and you're not losing any bearing contact when, while the cross section is shrinking. And you can put just one fixing in to keep it in place, provide a bit of a bit of um, yeah resistance from it shifting around. But really, bearing joints are are good for things like timber with a high moisture content. No, thanks for yeah, bringing that to yeah, moisture and timber and uh, the right species and the right strength grade yeah, make you know life everybody's life easier. Um, and there's been a direct message just to me saying it's a fascinating talk and I'm an architect. So Donald, <laughs> thank you for um, joining us. Um, and well, actually, this is going to be our final question. So what advice might you give us as architects with regards to any design principles or is it more a case of working closely with the engineers from inception and before we put pen to paper? Who wants to take it first? And... I mean, selfishly, I would say it's about important collaboration from the get-go. Uh, but in terms of general rules, I mean, it's, it's so hard. You can't really, as I said at the beginning, a connection can be the, the critical factor in the design. And, you know, some, some a designer might say, oh, you can get the design of your beam and double it if you've got a moment connection. But that's, it's so case by case basis. And it's very hard to give general advice. And really, um, yeah, if an architect wants to design a beautiful structure, he should find a, a, a passionate engineer to work with. I, I definitely agree. Andrew, any comments on that? And thank you for putting um, Panagotis's, um name in the chat. Yeah, I'll just try to find his email address there. Is there a <laughs> lecture at Birmingham <laughs> University? People can find it. So just coming back to the architects and uh, when, when do you think they should start working together? Um, I missed what was said before, but I think it's a very start. At the very I'm start, so I, think, I think we're all in agreement. There's a there's, there's one question coming. We were just going to squeeze this in from Sam. If connecting green oak to a steel column with a flitch plate, will the steel plates and column need to be stainless or can the flitch plate be stainless fixed back mildly with an isolation pad? It's, you know, it's because the green oak is not connected to it, but is near to it. So obviously, yes, mild steel can cause corrosion. So great, Sam, for understanding yeah, the, the oak and uh, steel um, problems. Andrew, do you want to pick that one up? Or are you, Sophie? I'm not too I sure think you were talking about this earlier, Tabitha, weren't you? <laughs> I was. Well, I was. I was talking about green timber, but not not oak in no, not oak in particular. So oak um, and sweet chestnut are both known to react um, with ferrous metals. So obviously, using mm. a stainless steel and the best type of stainless steel that you can you can use is you know the way to go if you're isolating it. Again, it'll be down to your connection. You're probably the people you buy the connections from, and to see what guarantees they're going to get to you know give you, but. Yeah. Yeah. No, no further on that. Right, I'm going to try and share screen and hopefully I'll just get the right one. Um, share. So I just want to say, and I'm sure the audience or our participants will utterly agree, a huge thank you to Andrew and Sophie for uh, giving such a fascinating and 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 informative, you know, talk on connections and hopefully. Um, we all learn, we'll now specify them differently and work, you know, understand and work better. And this is where my slide needs to go on. So Trada, uh, Trada and the Timber Trade Federation, now TDUK, have a number of resources which are online. Um, we run a student challenge. So any um, anybody who's a lecturer or a student here, please come and join us um, for 2024 when we will be looking at sustainable, affordable homes. Join us next week um, when uh, we will be looking at designing with engineered timber products. And there I am desperately searching for our speakers. So it'll be Kelly Harrison from Whitby Woods and Wojciech Powers from Edinburgh Napier. And with that, I'd just to say thank you all for joining us.